the measurable area of the sound system, but also phonology, which is the theoretical uh, mechanisms behind the sound systems and how they interrelate to one another. So phonology takes care of that. Then how um, words are built and how words are interrelated, that's morphology. Then how words themselves are arranged into sentences and phrases, that's syntax. And then how we achieve meaning, which is syntax and pragmatics. Um, and it's uh, and for me it was just uh, you know I got into linguistics because I, I came into college as a declared English major, and um, my mother prevailed upon me to take an undergraduate linguistics course despite the fact that I didn't want to because I was only interested in learning languages and I thought that learning about them sounded dull. Um, but I, I took this undergraduate uh, linguistics course, a general introduction, and it was so different from English. You know, uh, in English you, you read you read texts and you write essays, and here in linguistics it was just throwing a, a bunch of language data to you, and you would get to do these homework assignments that were almost like, you know, little puzzles to me, things that I might just do for fun if I felt like it, and this was the work, <laughs> at least at that stage of linguistics, you know, when you're taking your first course, and I thought that was just absolutely, the, it was like candy to me. So, so how did you go from studying linguistics to making up your own languages? I basically did it at the same time. So I created my first language uh, at the same time that I was taking my very first uh, undergraduate course in linguistics. Um, it was also at that time that I was taking a course in Esperanto, it was a student taught course, and then I was taking my second semester of Arabic and my first semester of Russian, as well as just uh, an English course on I think it was uh, 19th century literature. Um, and um, it was really, uh, all of those factors contributed to the idea. I had, um, the only created languages I had heard of were Esperanto and its competitors. So Esperanto, Volapük, Occidental, things like that. Um, those were the only ones I'd ever heard of, and I'd heard of them in my Esperanto class. So I came up with what I thought was a novel idea, which was to create a language that was just for my personal use. Um, I didn't think that anybody had ever done that before. I only thought <laughs> that people had created languages for international communication and world peace. Um, so I thought that this was really a novel idea, and I, I, it came to me during one of my linguistics courses, and I just took right to it. Um, several months later, I would find the, the other language creators in the language creation community and, and see you know, what, a, what, a, what a small fish in a large pond I was. Yeah, well, I mean, Lawrence, I mean, you mentioned meeting people in the pool, right? Could you talk a little bit more about how you got more and more involved in this community of language creation and how that led to you uh, learning Klingon? I, I think I had the very same sort of set, set of experiences that David had, and, and it's something that I see, I've seen repeated in almost anyone who gets bit by this, this artificial or constructed language bug. Uh, as an undergraduate, I started out in psychology, I switched my major to linguistics, and then I petitioned the university to allow me to construct my own major of psycholinguistics, taking courses from both those departments and a couple other uh, speech pathology departments and so forth, because I wanted all the tools to look at the same phenomenon from, from many different angles. Uh, and, and David is, 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 I took the words out of my mouth, it was candy. You know, people are giving you these puzzles, and and you're going to get a grade for it. What fun! It was it was just so sweet. Uh, and and when you start doing that, you start looking at the underlying structures. You start seeking patterns, and then you say, "Well, I could do that, but I'm going to do a different kind of pattern and see if that works out." And you start coming up with your own. Uh, at least in my my. Uh, case very rudimentary constructive language that never intended for it to go anywhere but it was just can I do this thing uh, and then I think I started with this when I was like 12 with the, with the, the people doing uh, Tolkien's language and Tolkien was still alive back then the Silmarillion hadn't come out you know we were constantly hoping for new words uh, and and it was it was just a very magical um, and years later, 
uh, when I was when I was a professor uh, teaching at a small college in Illinois, and and I needed a distraction because we'd been downsized, and, and so I was going to be out on my ear. Uh, I thought to myself, you know, if someone gave me a copy of the Klingon Dictionary, and I wish I could remember who, because they're responsible for everything they came after. And I just flashed back to what we've been doing with, with Quenya and Sindarin, and I said, I could do that with Klingon for a little while and see if there were other people around who wanted to play with this. Uh, and it was, it was just a series of fortunate circumstances and timing because the internet was just taking off at that time. There was no World Wide Web yet, but the sort of people who had email accounts were people in the government, people in the military, programmers, and college professors. And I quickly discovered that many, there's this huge subset of, of computer programmers who are into constructive languages, because that's what they're doing anyway. Program languages are, are miniature languages, uh, and there was a whole community out there. I mean, could you tell us a bit more about when you encountered the Klingon Dictionary? Um, how did that Klingon Dictionary come about? What was sort of the origins of the Klingon language? The Klingon language has, has, some, has a rather strange origin. Uh, in the original three years of, of, the, of the original series, we never get any Klingon language. Uh, we get a little bit in the very, in, the, in an opening sequence in the, I think it's the first film, uh, we see a few Klingon vessels in space and then they're blown up. Uh, but before they're blown up, uh, we hear some Klingon spoken and we see subtitles and there was no language then. There was just uh, the director going to, to James Doohan and saying, make up some sounds for me. Uh, because uh, James was a, a, a master of dialects. So he, in effect, created the first spoken Klingon, uh, and, and they said, here's what this means, and they put in the subtitles. Years later, when uh, Mark Okren was brought in for the third film, uh, he went back, he looked at and listened to the sounds from those few lines, and said, okay, any language I build has to have those sounds in it. And this string of sounds, this, this utterance, this sentence, has to mean what it said on the screen in the subtitles. But I can break it up in any way I want to get there. And that was his starting point. So those handful of sounds, and then he started adding to it. He was basically given two mandates. One, to create a language that felt utterly alien. And yet at the same time, could be spoken by actors. Uh, and and th th those those are, are diametrically opposed tasks, but I think he did a pretty good job. But there are all kinds of quirky things about Klingon that that rarely, if ever, occur in other naturally occurring languages. Uh, so whenever he had a chance to pick something and make it difficult, he did. <laughs> um, and David, is the Klingon language is that something that you studied or followed yourself at all? No, um, I wasn't aware that there was a Klingon language. Um, until very late, until I'd already start creating languages. Um, despite the fact that I was a fan of Star Trek The Next Generation, uh, a big fan, I, I watched it, I remember watching the first episode, and I really, I, I'd actually be very interested to go back and talk to myself and try to figure out why it never occurred to me that I, I like that, that there was a Klingon language, since there are plenty of words in it in the show even if they're not correct, um, as I learned, um, and, and, and plenty and plenty of utterances in there. I don't know why it never dawned on me, but it never did. Well, do you want to explain a little, when you say it's not correct, do you want to explain a, a bit more about what you mean by that? Uh, well, apparently, this is, this is true for Star Trek The Next Generation specifically. Um, apparently, uh, the Mark Oprin did translation for the first season of Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, he wasn't invited back to do translation for the rest of the show. Um, and since there was a Klingon dictionary out, the writers just kind of used it without really paying attention at all to how the grammar works. And if they didn't like a word, they'd change it, maybe add one. Uh, this is this about accurate, Lawrence? That's pretty accurate. It's, it, it was really horrible. And, and, and the, other, the other classic ploy of, of this sort of version of Klingon uh, is when in doubt, throw in apostrophes. Uh, 
Well, and and but don't pronounce the apostrophes as they're as they're used actually in Klingon, uh, because apostrophes look alien uh, when you see them in the subtitles. Uh, no matter how you know, string three or four of them together, it's just alien. Uh, so, and then and then of course the actors couldn't pronounce the things correctly. So you're listening to the show and you're and, and Klingon speakers are trying to figure out what the heck they meant to say. Uh, given context and and garbled pronunciation and you know utter ignorance of, of the syntax, uh, but uh, that 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 became a thing. Uh, that that was another fun thing to do with the language. Uh, a, a regular feature when the KLI uh, was doing its journal would be here's what e- here's what aired you know in the past month or the past quarter on television, and here's what they were trying to say, here's what we think they meant. In some cases, the studios were kind enough to send me a script so I could actually get a transcription, which which would look nothing like what were on the subtitles, <laughs> and, and, and or even less resemblance to what, what you heard. Uh, but uh, we, we ran that under the, under the, the line, uh, everyday Klingon. <laughs> Yeah, it's an it's an interesting puzzle for all the wrong reasons. Basically. <laughs> yes, yes, and and what, what's what's fascinating to well, fascinating might be going over the line, but depends on how geeky your uh, your listeners are. In some instances, Mark Okren went back and and retconned an error. Wow, why? <laughs> be, because he could. Uh, because you didn't. Because there, there's a, a scene from an episode of, of Deep Space Nine. Uh, they did. Uh, they did a show where they brought back the three original Klingons from the, from the original series, and one of them sees another, and he calls out to him, "My friend," and he uses the word for friend in a word that could be "my," uh, but that's not how you construct that in Klingon. Uh, and the, Klingon has has uh, nominal suffixes to indicate possession rather than a separate word uh, and it also has gender in a way that's different from the way English for example uses gender it's not to determine uh, sex but rather to determine whether something is intelligent or not so he, he used he said my friend in a way that not only was syntactically wrong it also meant my friend who cannot speak who is who is no obviously no more intelligent than an inanimate object, and so Mark went back and said, "Oh no, this obviously insulting thing is something that a really good friend would call another." Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, so Lawrence, I mean, it sounds like the 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 movie studio, etc., was just really not. Did, they didn't care about the the Klingon language stuff. Is is that true of all the Star Trek stuff up to the present day, or did they ever start caring about it more? It varied a lot. You know, I, th- I think the difference is between a film and, and a TV show is you've got one week to churn out this episode and get the next one and get geared up. For-